Lesson 3, Interactions Among Living Things. Things we will be able to do after this lesson. Explain how adaptations help an organism survive. Describe competition and predation. And identify the three types of symbiosis. My Planet Diary, Predator Power. What predator can close its jaw the fastest? You might think it's a lion or a shark, but you would be wrong. It is the trap jaw ant that has the fastest strike in the animal kingdom. The trap jaw ant closes its mouth around prey in 0.13 milliseconds at a speed of 35 to 64 meters per second. The force created when its jaw snaps shut also helps the ant escape danger by either jumping up to 8.3 centimeters high or 39.6 centimeters sideways. Answer the questions below. Number one says, how does the trapped jaw ant's adaptation help it avoid becoming the prey of another organism? Well, we know the ant can jump, sorry for my chicken scratch, away from predators. So the ant can jump away from predators that are trying to attack. We know this because it says can jump up to this feet high or this feet sideways. Or centimeters, I mean. Number two says, what are some adaptations that other predators have to capture prey? These things can include, but are not limited to, speed, Claws, good eyes, good eyesight, being able to see super well, sometimes even at night, having sharp teeth, um, being able to blend in to the background, all of those, and more. Figure one shows some organisms that live in on and around the saguaro cactus. Each organism has unique characteristics. These characteristics affect the individual's ability to survive and reproduce in its environment. Natural selection. A characteristic that makes an individual better suited to a specific environment may eventually become common in that species through a process called natural selection. Natural selection works like this. Individuals whose unique characteristics are well suited for an environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. Offspring that inherit these characteristics also live to reproduce. In this way, natural selection results in adaptations, the behaviors and physical characteristics that allow organisms to live successfully in their environment. For example, the Arctic hare has fur that turns from gray to white in the winter, which helps camouflage the hare against the snow. Individuals with characteristics poorly suited to a particular environment are less likely to survive and reproduce. Over time, poorly suited characteristics may disappear from the species. If a species cannot adapt to changes in its environment, the entire species can disappear from Earth and become extinct. Just like the dodo bird. R.I.P. the dodo bird. This here is figure one, the saguaro community. What they want us to do is circle two examples of how organisms interact in this scene and then describe each one. There are so many things that are happening during this scene. One of them is these little wasps down here at the bottom or middle. Well, we can see that the wasps have built a hive under a branch of the cactus. 
so it's hidden it's a bit shady harder for some animals to reach we also see up here our red-tailed hawk and some other birds and we can see that the red-tailed hawk has built a nest between the branches of the cactus some other things we have an elf owl who has decided to make a home inside of there that little rattlesnake hiding at the bottom down here woodpeckers trying to get some food the organisms in the saguaro community have adaptations that result in specific roles the role of an organism in its habitat is called its niche a niche includes what type of food the organism eats how it obtains this food and what other organisms eat it a niche also includes when and how the organism reproduces and the physical conditions it requires to survive. Some organisms, like birds in figure two, share the same habitat but have very specific niches that allow them to live together. Every organism has a variety of adaptations that are suited to its specific living conditions and help it survive. Apply it! Organisms occupy many niches in an environment like the one in this picture. Number one says identify, so list two abiotic factors in this picture. Hmm, what I remember abiotic factors are. Well, biotic factors are living or were once living. So abiotic are things that are not living and never have been living. Some things include in this picture, sunlight and water. Number two says, interpret diagrams. Describe the niche of the squirrel in the picture. Here's our squirrel, here's our buddy. We know a niche includes what type of food it eats, how it obtains the food, and what other organisms eat it. So what's the niche of the squirrel in this picture? Well, we can see that the squirrel, I'm gonna call him Rob, is eating. Uh, it looks like he has some seeds and nuts during the daytime. Because it's daytime, you have the sun out. So, part of the niche of this squirrel is it eats nuts and seeds. Number three, make generalizations. What adaptations might the squirrel have that make it able to live in this environment? Well, probably, if the squirrel Rob is eating seeds and nuts, he's going to have to have, so Rob has sharp teeth. He has sharp teeth. Otherwise, how's he going to be able to get into the nuts? He can't even open them unless he can bang it against the wall, but he's not Chippendale. He's Rob, so he has sharp teeth probably. What are competition and predation? During a typical day in the saguaro community, a range of interactions take place among organisms. Two major types of interactions among organisms are competition and predation. Competition. Different species can share the same habitat and food requirements. For example, the flycatcher and the elf owl both live on the saguaro and eat insects. However, these two species do not occupy exactly the same niche. The flycatcher is active during the day, while the owl is active mostly at night. If two species occupy the same niche, one of the species might eventually die off. The reason for this is competition. The struggle between organisms to survive as they attempt to use the same limited resources is called competition. 
For example, weeds in a garden compete with the vegetable crops for soil nutrients, water, and sunlight. In any ecosystem, there are limited amounts of food, water, and shelter. Organisms that share the same habitat often have adaptations that enable them to reduce competition. For example, the three species of warblers in Figure 2 specialize in feeding only in a certain part of the spruce tree. Alright, here we've got Figure 2, Niche and Competition. Each of these warbler species occupies a very specific location in its habitat. By feeding on insects in different areas of the tree, the birds avoid competing for food and are able to live together. So we have the Cape May Warbler. This species feeds at the tip of branches near the top of the tree. We have the Bay Breasted Warbler. This species feeds in the middle part of the tree. And we have the yellow rumped warbler. This species feeds in the lower part of the tree and at the bases of the middle branches. So they're all sharing the same tree, but they are all kind of cut off. Cut off a bit. Number one says predict. What could happen if these warbler species fed in the same location on the tree? Well, perhaps if they fed in the same area, one warbler that doesn't look like it says warbler let's try that again warbler warbler could get all the food but the other warblers wouldn't have any so they might not survive so this guy up here, we're gonna call him Blaine. That's a good warbler name. Gets all the food and he's happy and he's eating all the food. But then we have Kurt. And we have, I forgot other names. Well, I guess we'll call him Kevin. There we go. And poor Kurt and Kevin don't get any of the food. So they're probably not going to make it. Rest in peace, Kurt and Kevin. Number two says, for what resources do the tree and the grass compete? We have our tree and we have our grass. Hmm. Well, both tree and grass need similar things to survive, like sunlight or water or minerals. Or, or space. Predation. In figure three, a tiger shark bursts through the water to seize an albatross in its powerful jaws. An interaction in which one organism kills another for food or nutrients is called predation. The organism that does the killing is the predator. The organism that is killed is the prey. Even though they do not kill their prey, organisms like cows and giraffes are also considered predators because they eat plants. Predation can have a major effect on a prey population size. Recall that when the death rate exceeds the birth rate in a population, the population size can decrease. So if there are too many predators in an area, the result is often a decrease in the size of the prey population. But a decrease in the number of prey results in less food for their predators. Without adequate food, the predator population can decline. Generally, populations of predators and their prey rise and fall in related cycles. This is figure four right down here at the bottom. It says predator adaptations. A jellyfish's tentacles contain a poisonous substance that paralyzes tiny water animals. The sundew is a plant that is covered with sticky bulbs on stalks. When a fly lands on a bulb, it remains snared in the sticky goo while the plant digests it. Okay, that's actually kind of gross. 
Disgusting. Predator adaptations. Predators, such as those shown in figure four, like that nasty little flower thing, have adaptations that help them catch and kill their prey. A cheetah can run very fast for a short time, enabling it to catch its prey. Some predators, such as owls and bats, have adaptations that enable them to hunt at night, when their prey, small mammals and insects, are active. Prey Adaptations How do organisms avoid being killed by effective predators? The smelly spray of a skunk and the sharp quills of a porcupine help keep predators at a distance. As you can see in Figure 5, organisms have many kinds of adaptations that can help them avoid becoming prey. So down here, this is Figure 5, it says the organisms display a wide range of adaptations that help them avoid becoming prey. They want you to rate each prey adaptation from one which is the best to five which is the worst in the circle. And then explain your best choice, so the one you ranked number one. This is a question that is on your worksheet, but I will read through it. So we have warning coloring. Like many brightly colored animals, this frog is poisonous. Its bright blue and yellow colors warn predators not to eat it. We have false coloring. Predators may be confused by a false eye spot and attack the wrong end of the fish. This allows the fish to swim safely away in the opposite direction. We have mimicry. The mimic octopus on the top imitates the coloring, shape, and swimming style of the venomous soulfish at the bottom to discourage predators. We have protective covering. Have you ever seen a pine cone with a face? This is a pangolin, a small African mammal. When threatened, the pangolin protects itself by rolling up into a scaly ball. And we have camouflage. Is it a leaf? Actually, it's a walking leaf insect. But if you were a predator, you might be fooled into looking elsewhere for a meal. Diners, dives, and jives. So, on your worksheet, you're gonna label, rank these from best to worst, one through five, and then tell me why you chose which one for the first, the best thing here. D -d -d Do the math. Predator prey interactions. On Isle Royale, an island in Lake Superior, ooh, relevant, that's close to home, the populations of wolves, the predator, and moose, the prey, rise and fall in cycles. Use the graph to answer the questions. What graph this graph? Number one says, what variable is plotted on the horizontal axis? And what two variables are plotted on the vertical axis? Okay, so horizontal, that means we're going this way. So we have the year. And vertical means we're going this way. Got my ears. And we can see, oh, we have two. We have one for number of wolves. And we have one for number of moose. Which the plural and singular form of moose is the same. Number two, how did the moose population change between 2002 and 2007? What happened to the wolf population between 2003 and 2006? Okay, so we're looking at the moose population first. Between 2002 and 2007, moose is blue. So we come here, and eh, 2002 is probably like here. 2007 is probably like here. So what happened to the blue line? Well, it went down. So moose population decreased. It went down. What happened to the wolf population between 2003 and 2006? It's about the same dash marks. Wolves are red. So in that same area, what do we notice? Well, 
at the same time, our wolf, wolf population increased. It went up. Hmm. Number three says, how might the change in moose population have led to the change in the wolf population? Hmm. Well, perhaps as the, as, so we're gonna try this, as M for moose increased, more food was available. We can see like leading right up to it. Oh, it sparked. There's a up here, right here, it went up. So around that same time, moose population skyrocketed a bit. So more foods available. Making sure that wolf population could increase as well. Number four says, what adaptations does a wolf have that make it a successful predator? When I think of a wolf, I think of a dog, but meaner. So probably they have sharp claws slash teeth so they can attack and eat their prey. They probably have speed of a wolf. <laughs> Eyesight is up, smell is up, but in the sense of they can smell really good, not in the sense of they stink, but also probably they stink. And number five, how might disease in the wolf population one year affect the moose population the next year? So okay, we have wolves, boom, there's like a thousand of them, and then they get sick. And some of them die. Rest in peace, dead wolves. And now we have 300 wolves. Well, if the wolf population, so wolf pop, would go down. Because the wolf population went down, that means there's fewer wolves eating the moose. So because of that, moose pop population would increase because the wolves have died out sad there's less eating so the moose are just like oh swag in a bag i'm super happy what are the three types of symbiosis in addition to competition and predation symbiosis is a third type of interaction among organisms Symbiosis is a relationship in which two species live closely together and at least one of the species benefits. The three types, main types of symbiotic relationships are mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Mutualism. In some relationships, two species may depend on one another. This is true for some species of acacia tree and stinging ants in South America. The stinging ants nest only in the acacia tree, whose thorns discourage the ants predators. The tree also provide the ants only food. The ants in turn attack other animals that approach the tree and clear competing plants away from the base of the tree. This relationship is an example of mutualism. A relationship in which both species benefit is called mutualism. Other examples can be seen in figure six. So here's figure six. We've got an ox pecker rides and snacks aboard an impala, not the car. The ox pecker eats ticks living on the impala's ears, again, not the car. This interaction is an example of mutualism because both organisms benefit. What? How does the ox pecker benefit from this? Well, the ox pecker gets food. How does the impala benefit from this? Well, the impala gets rid of ticks. So 
So bird boy gets to eat the ticks. Deer looking boy gets the ticks eaten and is happy. Ooh, number three is a ch 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 challenge. Explain how the relationship between the hummingbird and the flower is an example of mutualism. What? Okay, hmm. Well, they both get something out of it. So what does the hummingbird get out of this? Well, it gets food. Sticks its long nose into other people's business and gets the food. Then the flower, how can the flower benefit? Ah, uh, the flower benefits by getting pollinated, just like with bees and other birds. They pick up pollen from one plant and bring it to the next to help the plant population thrive. All right, so we have mutualism, where two things both benefit. We also have commensalism. So have you ever seen a bird build a nest in a tree? The bird gets a place to live while the tree is unharmed. This relationship is an example of commensalism. Commensalism is a relationship in which one species benefits and the other species is neither helped nor harmed. In nature, commensalism is not very common because two species are usually either helped or harmed a little by any interaction. So mutualism, both things benefit. Commensalism, one things benefit, but the other just is there. Nothing happens. And we have parasitism. Many families, the many family pets get treated with medication to prevent tick and flea bites. Without treatment, pets can suffer from severe health problems as a result of these bites. A relationship that involves one organism living with, on, or inside another organism and harming it is called parasitism. The organism that benefits is called a parasite. The organism it lives on or in is called a host. The parasite is usually smaller than the host. In a parasitic relationship, the parasite benefits while the host is harmed. Unlike a predator, a parasite does not usually kill the organism it feeds on. If the host dies, the parasite could lose its source of food or shelter. Some parasites, like fleas and ticks, have adaptations that enable them to attach to their host and feed on its blood. Other examples of parasitism are shown in Figure 7. So remember, mutualism is like win-win situation. So both sides win. They both get something out of it. Commensalism is win neutral. So one side wins, gets something, the other side is just there. And parasitism is a win lose situation. So one side wins, they get the goods, they get the food. The other side, it ain't so good. They're losing blood. They're losing, I don't know, tears. Blood, sweat, and tears. So sad. There are many examples of parasitic relationships. Besides fleas, ticks, and tapeworms, some plants and birds are parasites. So let's take a peek at these three different types. We have um, a parasitic cowbird lays its eggs in a yellow warbler's nest. The cowbird chick is out competing the warbler chicks for space and food. We have fish lice feeding on the blood of and other internal fluids of a fish. And dwarf mistletoe is a small parasitic flowering plant that grows into the bark of trees to obtain water and nutrients. So we need to find out, well, which of this is the parasite and which is the host? So let's look again. A parasitic cowbird, ooh, that even tells us right there, parasitic, so cow bird lays its eggs in a yellow warbler's nest. So who's the host? Yellow warbler. And 
then they're gonna keep feeding those yellow warblers are gonna feed the baby birds but the one who's gonna get the most baby cowbird um, we have fish lice feeding on the blood and other internal fluids of fish so parasite and that fish lice they're getting something out of it who's losing something well the fish and we have dwarf mistletoe is a small parasitic flowering plant that grows into the bark of trees. So we know dwarf mistletoe is the parasite. And who's the host? Um, the tree, not just plants, the tree. Why doesn't a parasite usually kill its host? Well, if a parasite killed the host, there probably would not be a readily available food source, and the parasite itself might die. Apply it! Each photograph on the right represents a different type of symbiosis. Classify each interaction as mutualism, commensalism, or parasitism. Explain your answers. So interaction 1, top photo, it says a remora fish attaches itself to the underside of a shark without harming the shark and eats leftover bits of food from the shark's meals. Would that be mutualism, commensalism, or parasitism? I'd say this is commensalism. Why? Well, the remora is benefiting. It's getting the leftover scraps and it's getting a little bit of some shelter. But it's not harming or benefiting the shark at all. Shark is just there. Interaction two, we have a vampire bat drinks the blood of horses. Fun. Would that be mutualism, commensalism, or parasitism? Well, in that case, I'm gonna say it's parasitism. The bat is getting the blood. It's getting some food. But the horse, well, the horse is harmed, my dude. The horse is getting blood sucked out of it. It's like a mosquito sucking up your blood, but worse. Because a bat is bigger than a mosquito. In Interaction 3, a bee pollinates a flower. Gotta love those bumblebees. That, my dear dudes, would be mutualism. The bee gets food, the flower gets pollinated. So it's able to reproduce, my dudes. There we go. So, from remembering, three types of symbiosis are mutualism, win-win situation, commensalism, win-neutral situation, and parasitism, win-lose situation. That's it. That's all I got. That's all she wrote. Go do your worksheet. Have a great day.